This paper is uh, <clears throat> Summer 21, 1-2. Uh, so the first question is uh, a simple one, so just pause it and check your answers. Okay, so part B, a little bit more complicated, benefits of converting binary to hex. So it's easier to read, write, and understand, easier to identify errors, takes up less screen display space, and less chance of making error. So don't just say, as some people have done in the past, easier and quicker. And don't say it takes up less space. Say it takes up less screen space, because it doesn't take up any less space in memory. And when you're saying that something in general is easier, quicker, you have to say easier and quicker to do what? And in this case, it's to read, write, or understand, or identify errors and bugs. You don't necessarily have to say why. You could go on and explain that, but you need to, to be clear about that bit. Uses of hexadecimal, they've already uh, suggested uh, HTML, markup language, so some other uses. MAC address, assembly language, IP address, memory dumps. Here's some examples. There's your MAC address. This is in hexadecimal. The first bit is the organization. The second bit is the, I, the identifier for that particular card, network interface card. Uh, here is an example of IP version 6. So IP version 4 uses deanery numbers, but IP version 6 uses hexadecimal and it's much larger, version 6. And here's some example of assembly code using hexadecimal. So this should help you to remember some of the other uses apart from HTML colors in hexadecimal. Remember if you do say HTML you have to say HTML colors. These are uses of hexadecimal. Question 2 is on data storage and magnetic solid state or optical. We'll have a quick look at the answers. No moving parts, pits and lands, data stored in platters, flash memory is used. These are NAND gates, actually. And parts are rotated, that's optical. And data can be stored permanently on all three. A quick look at that. There's your different platters on the hard drive. Data stored magnetically in sectors. And this moves across. SSD, solid state drive, no moving parts, saves power, it's plugged into the motherboard, um, and these are NAND gates, and also it's non-volatile, non-volatile means the days is not lost when the power is turned off, and there's your optical discs, these are your CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray, and they have, here's your pits and your lands, this is where the light is reflected back off, and it gets smaller and more dense as you use a, a smaller light wave and that's why it stores more data. Remember DVD RAM uses concentric circles and the data is stored and you can read and write at the same time with DVD RAM, R-A-M. With the rest of the CDs, DVDs and Blu-rays they use uh, spiral tracks rather than concentric circles. Magnetic storage, optical storage, is of course a hard disk drive for magnetic uh, or magnetic tape which is also used to back things up and optical storage can either be a CD, DVD or Blu-ray Blu disk. Identify storage for a web server and justify your choice. So you have three marks so one here and two points here for the justification. So your type of storage is either going to be something like magnetic hard drive drive or solid state. So a justification for a hard drive is it's likely to receive many requests a day and store a lot of data and the magnetic disk has high capacity. Another justification could be that it's cheaper. Another one is longevity. Another justification is no requirement for it to be portable unlike SSD which is lighter. Or you might have said SSD and a justification would be it's more energy efficient, the same thing, many requests a day, because it's still fast and it's got high volume storage, but it also runs cooler, SSD runs cooler, and um, 
and it's got fast read write speeds to ha handle high volume of traffic. Describe the operation of a USB flash memory. It's the operation, how is it operated and how does it store data? And we have, it's flashed onto silicon chips. That's why it's called flash. It uses NAND gates, uh, transistors, which are switches to control the flow. These are the, uh, the gates that we learned about to control the flow of electrons. Um, it's a type of EEPROM. EEPROM stands for Electronically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. So even though it's read-only memory, you can program it and it's electronically erasable, which really means it's not read-only because you can write to it. But that's what EEPROM stands for, Electronically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. And it's a type of that, the flash. When the data is stored in transistors, which are switches, is converted from ones and zeros, binary. So remember, switches can be in an on-off state. That's basically how the computer works, billions of switches. And it writes and reads sequentially. Sequentially means um, one after another. So this is how it works. Question number three, it's a logic gate. Relatively complex, Look at, let's look at the brackets. We have not A and B first. So here's our not A and B. Then we have not A and B or C. So we add the or C, so it's coming down to here. And then we have and, so we put in our and gate, and B. Then we take the nor, we put in the nor, and B or C. So it's a B or C heading into the nor, coming out of here. And that's how we break down the brackets. This is an odd way of presenting this question. What they do is they give you a completed truth table uh, with mistakes in it, and they ask you to find the four mistakes. So all you need to do is work out the truth table and then flip the bits. So it's rows two, three, seven, and eight. So rows two, that would be a zero, three, flip it, seven, flip it, and eight. So I suggest you work this out Flip the bits and check your answers. Six point here on malware or different types of threats. And here are the answers, so check these. Spyware captures all the data entered. So a keystroke logger, this example. Uh, installed onto a web server, virus or spyware. Prevents access to website, a denial of service, or even a DDoS, which is distributed denial of service attack. Uh, malicious code on a computer, a virus, or spyware, self-replicating, just like a, a human virus, and damaging files in the user's hard drive, virus. These ones, um, this one doesn't tend to damage, this one tends to just steal. Identify three other types of internet security risks. We have phishing, farming, and hacking. Let's look at these. Phishing, so when we get a fake email with a fake link that's trying to get your details, it's trying to steal your uh, personal details. Farming is when an attacker injects a fake DNS domain name server entry into your DNS server and then it sends you off to a fake website. Farming sends you off to a fake website. Well, what is a DNS server? Let's remember, a DNS server is when we connect, we type in a URL, URL goes off to a DNS server that we're connected to, and the DNS server looks up the IP address and returns it to your browser so that your browser can go to the web server. So what happens with farming is they send you to, on your computer, it sends you to a fake DNS server they control. So when you type in a legitimate URL, they send you a fake IP address that sends you to the fake website. And then once again, they're trying to steal your uh, private details. Three ways that data can be accidentally damaged or lost. Human error, an easy one to remember. People can accidentally delete files. Power failure search, this happened to me. Uh, it was a lightning storm. I didn't turn off my computer. The uh, tower block got hit and the power surged and burned up my computer. Hardware failure, particularly a hard disk. A hard disk will regularly, when they get to the end of lives, 
the disks will crash and it's difficult to get your data off of it. You can, but it's difficult. Software failure and fires. Fire happens a lot in buildings and flood. This happened to a school one time. Uh, a pipe leaked and leaked onto the server and destroyed their uh, computers with all the pupils working it. So these things do happen. So these are other ways that you can lose data. Here it is, a data sensing question or computer control. And as I mentioned, there's quite often one with seven or eight marks and that's 10% of this entire paper. 10% it always follows the same format. First of all, we're looking at a couple sensors a light sensor and a motion sensor for this particular case study. Remember, there's no such thing as a heat sensor, only a temperature sensor if the question has temperature. And here we go, describe how the sensors work. And this is the thing that always repeats in largely the same manner. Sensor sends data to the microprocessor, uses analog to digital conversion. The microprocessor compares to store values if a value is outside. This bit will vary, but it always sends, sends ADC, compares to stored data, then if something in the case study, and then generally we're going to um, affect some kind of output device. And here we go, I've gone over this before. There's a picture of an actuator. This is an output device that um, can do some kind of movement, open a pipe or, or close some, some kind of mechanical movement. The other output is uh, going to be a light or something like that. So an easy way to get 10% of your exam correct. Question number six, we've got cookies here. Now be careful on this because they're asking you to describe how cookies can be used to store and also actually enter user's payment details. They're not asking you what cookies are to describe how they're used. So read the question carefully and let's look at this. The web server sends a cookie to the browser the details are stored in an encrypted text file. The cookie is stored by the browser on your hard drive, basically in your temporary internet files, unless you're using Chrome incognito mode, in which case it won't. Um, and then when the user revisits the website, the web server, server requests the cookie file, and, and then it can find information out about you. It identifies you, basically. Four points here on why users may be concerned about their personal data and online browsing habits stored in cookies. Now, this is why they're concerned whether it's a real risk or not, but they include users don't know what information is stored on the cookie, so they feel the privacy is affected. Uh, a profile could be built up about a user and could expose a user's identity. Sensitive information could be stored or intercepted in transmission. And other websites, not the one that gave you the cookie, could gain access to the cookies. That's users' fears. Or perhaps computer could be hacked and payment information could be stolen by a third party. These are some of the legitimate fears that people have about uh, cookies. Question seven, HTML, structure and presentation. So this is structures, HTML, presentation, CSS. And let's have a quick look at that. So what do we mean by structure? Placement of the text and images, the margins, the line breaks, padding, that's how far out you are um, in between paragraphs and things like that. That is the structure. The presentation is font color, font style, size, background color, image size. And this is handled by the cascading style. If we look here, we have HTML. We have the head, the body, heading one, heading two paragraphs. This is an ordered list and list items. We also have hyperlinks. We have whether the hyperlink comes above or below an image. That's what we mean by structure. And the cascading style sheet tells us when we're using the heading one and heading two. Is the font color going to be red? Is it going to be blue? What size is it going to be? Is it going to be centered alignment? This is what we mean by the presentation and the structure. Uh, they also have JavaScript, not anything you need to worry about, but this is the behavior. This makes things happen like pressing a button or something on a web page. Why do we 
separate the HTML into structure and presentation. And that way we can easily change the style of the web page uh, so the CSS can be used to create a template style sheet and add new content to the whole website. So what does that mean? Well, if we look at this, we see that we link within the HTML pages to the style sheet we've created, default.css here. So if I have 30 pages and I link to one style sheet, and then in that one style sheet, in that one style sheet, I define what the body tag will look like, the color, the background, uh, a link, what it will look like, the background, um, and other elements, then this one style sheet will show up all of the changes that will show up in all 30 pages that have this link in them and that's why we call it cascading cascading because one change will cascade across the whole thing question eight six marks almost 10 percent, just under 10 percent on um, keyboard but you have to know how the keyboard works so let's have a quick look at this one let's fill it in so a keyboard has a matrix underneath the keys when the key is pressed it presses a switch that completes the circuit this allows the current, the electricity, to flow. The location of the key press is calculated. The lo location of the key press is compared to a character map to find the binary value for that key that has been pressed. I have a quick look. There's a key on a keyboard. There's a switch that you press, and you can see it's sending the data. And this is what's underneath your keyboard. These are the little switches that are underneath your keyboard, and that's how the whole thing works.